Caching is useful for lots of different things. In this video, I'm gonna show you how we can store API responses on hand quickly and easily so we don't have to make the same call multiple times. I'm gonna show you two methods how to do it and at the end, we're gonna put it into a fast API application so you can see how you can really get the benefits from it. So I have a basic example up on the screen here. So we are importing in requests and uh, rich print, which is great for printing stuff out. If you haven't tried it before, give it a go. Uh, we have our request down here. Now it's worth noting that uh, we are calling this API with the character ID that we're gonna give it and we're gonna just gonna print that data out here. I have the hook put into the response. So you can see that every time we make a request using this session, it's gonna print out the URL. And then down here, I'm basically just asking for the same information twice. So when I add in the caching, you'll see the difference here. So let's run this one. You can see that we have two sets of data here, uh, both the same, obviously, we've made the same request. And you can see we've got the URL both times, and that's telling me that we are making a request to that, that URL both times. So let's add in the first cache that we're gonna try. So we'll do uh, from its func tools, and we're gonna import in cache. So the way that this cache works is that we use it as a decorator. So we can just decorate our function with the at cache here. What this is gonna do is it's actually going to store whatever comes out of this function uh, in the temporary cache that we can then call it back from that place there. So I'm gonna save again and we'll run it again here and you'll see that the second time round after that pause from the time.sleep, we don't have that URL pasted, that URL printed out from our hook, which means that this information here, this response came from the cache. Now, this sort of cache from Funk Tools is much better at storing things like uh, complicated or more expensive function calls that are not so much for actually API requests. Now that's where the next one comes in that we want to talk about, which is the requests cache. So this video is sponsored by IP Royal. So if you're asking me what the hardest part of web scraping is, the first thing I'm going to tell you is it's going to be scaling up your web scrapers. But fortunately, you can check out the proxies from IP Royal that's going to help you out with that a lot. You can have data center proxies, which are just great for massive throughput, or the ones that I use, which are the Royal residential proxies that are 100% genuine residential IPs from across the globe. These are the best ones for scraping data. You can easily put them into new and existing projects. It's just one line of text that needs to go into your request. You can choose which countries you want to include and exclude, and they will all auto rotate for you, making it super easy. There's also unlimited concurrent requests as well. So async is absolutely not a problem. If you're interested in this, go ahead and check out the link in the description below and also use my code JWR30 for 30% off your first Royal Residential Proxy order. Link in the description, my code is JWR30. So request cache is a uh, separate package that basically adds on to the requests that we know and love and gives us access to this cached session thing here. What this does for us is it gives us the opportunity to actually create a cache session and specify a backend. And if you see down here, in this instance, I'm using SQLite. And it's gonna store all of these responses in that database for us, and then we can call them back when we make this call again. So what this means is we can just use this session here as we would a normal uh, request session, make all of our requests, and it's going to store the response from that request in the cache. So if we make a duplicate one like we did in the last script there, you'll see that it actually comes from the cache rather than the uh, API itself, saving us calls, making our lives a lot quicker and easier. You'll notice here that I'm printing out some information too. When we use the cache session, we also have the option to print out the response, whether it was from the cache, when it was created, and when it expires. This information comes from generally the cached headers. So when you make this request, the response has headers, and this will come from there, generally speaking. It also gives you an option to say how long you want things to expire with this expire after. Now this won't really work in this because this obviously only goes for the length of time that the code is running. So you'll notice I've put one in here and a time.sleep here and then removing all the expired responses so you'll see that come through. Um, but let's have a go and let's run this now and we'll see what we get to. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is we're going to uh, leave our cache session here 
and we will ask for these and then we'll see which URLs are cached. Uh, what I'm going to do though is I'm going to actually comment out uh, these lines here. Uh, we'll print out these ones and we'll leave the what's this one URLs in the cache there. So we'll do that first. So let's go ahead and clear this up and run Python 3. And this one is called Tash Cache Twist Request. There we go, got it. So let's have a look and see what's happened here. So we have made uh, three requests. And you can see we have false, none, none, false. And this is this information here. Response from cache, created, etc., etc. So from cache, and the first one is none. Then it's none again. And now here, you can see we've asked for number 46 again. So this is the same the same request, and we have a true. So this request came from the cache, which means we didn't actually make another request to the API to get the same data back. It stored it for us. We can see the expires from and everything down here. Then you can see that we have specific URL data saved in the cache. So we know that the cache data that comes back from these specific URLs is stored. So this is particularly useful when you're making requests via an, to an API, or maybe you're pulling some data down from a web somewhere, because it will store the information for us, meaning much less requests. So let's go ahead and add back in these here, so we'll be able to uh, remove the re expired responses. And now note, this is gonna test the expire after. That's why I have expire after one second, but I have time.sleep.2 here, so we'll see what happens now. So you can see there's our request for uh, True, this one was in the cache. This one was in the cache because we ran it already. So these ones are stored. So these ones were stored in the cache. So we didn't actually make any responses here. These two were stored. And now because we ran this uh, clear cache remove expired responses, because we set them to expire after one second, we got clear our cache there. So hopefully you can kind of get how this works. Now, the most common way that you're going to see this is in an application. So you need to think that perhaps you are running an application that allows your users to input some information like what we were just doing and then actually create responses, uh, create API requests to an external API or your database. You can then cache to make it accessible much quicker and, and uh, have less outgoing. So what I've got here is a simple script. I'll just run it first. It's probably easier that way. And let me grab my browser. So we can see we have a simple form and you put in the character ID and you get the name back under here. Some uh, top class web design there. So we can have a look and you can see that I've already got a load of cached URLs. And that means all of this data from this API is stored in my cache. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close off my server here. Okay, so I've deleted our cache. Let's have a quick look at what's actually happening now that you've seen the end response. So instead of using the session cache like we did in the last one, we want to have a kind of global all around cache. And that's done by using what they call patching and basically just saying, use this cache for every, re every request we're going to make. So this was our main page template. And here is our post request. And this is where we put in the information to post back. So we've got a form and it's going to send data to the same API, the same same um, URL that we were looking at in our other pieces of code. And then we have our uh, what's in the cache uh, and then our response. So now that I've deleted the actual cache itself, let's run this again and let's start making some more requests. So let's go for now the ID of one, two and three. So let's go ahead and make one again and then come back to our code. You can see that we now have the cached URLs showing here as one, two, and three. This means that now whenever we make a request that's going to have this ID in again, instead of querying the server, the API, we're going to use the data that's cached in our database. Now I didn't set this to expire in any way. You probably would want to play with that. And also if you're doing caching like this for your actual application, you're probably going to want to look into using Redis, which is going to give you a much quicker up to date store. And also you can look at caching your own more complicated database queries in that so when your users make that request again you've got that data on hand and you don't have to go ahead and query your database so hopefully you guys have got a better understanding now of how caching can work how you might want to use it for making requests to apis or put it in your applications so thank you very much for watching if you've enjoyed this video i think you're going to like this one here too